And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Mark McNeil, talking about St. Thomas Aquinas and the very important issue of God's divine simplicity. So right before the break, Mark, you you know, man, Aquinas really does set the standard pretty high. Not only is God not comprised of parts in a physical quantitative sense, but he, he can't even make metaphysical distinctions. He's so utterly one. Yeah, and, and the... the um... The description that I just read was really a summation of all that's found in the other articles here that one would have to work through all the details of those to see the strength of the argument. But you're absolutely right. All the ways in which, for example, you can differentiate between uh, two angels, for instance, who don't have bodies for Aquinas. They don't have there's no matter there. But even though there's not a distinction between matter and form, to use Aristotle's categories that Aquinas uses, even though there's not a distinction between matter and form, there is a, a, a distinction between their essence and their existence. Uh, they are they are given the gift of existence by God. Uh, they're not their own existence. They don't exist necessarily. Uh, but when it comes to God, that distinction collapses, that God is, is his very essence. God is his being. Uh, he doesn't have being. He is being. Uh, and the same is true with everything else. God is not in a, a genus. He's not a species in a larger genus. Uh, like, for instance, uh, you know, humans are in the the larger genus of mammals, for example, or or you know, we can move up the line of of ways in which we differentiate and also combine things together based on similarities and differences. And Aquinas says God doesn't stand under any genus. God is the cause of all genus species distinctions, uh, but God is in a category all its own, uh, and He's the only instance of that kind of reality. Uh, he is his own being. Everything else has being as a gift to it uh, because of other contingent factors that allow them to have being. Uh, and then they also exist with a particular kind of essence, a created essence that limits its expression of being in some way. Uh, so uh, a tree can express being as a tree. I can express it as a human being. The squirrel as a squirrel and all these different things have limited modes of being that restrict what they are and put them under a larger category. God has no such restrictions. God is pure being itself. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so anyway, Aquinas here uh, sums up uh, all of those ways of making distinctions and says that they can't apply to God, uh, that in God we have uh, absolute uh, simplicity. That is, God is not composed of multiple principles or parts uh, that could be envisioned as uh, separable from each other. That might raise questions regarding the uh, the mystery of the Trinity, and, uh, and Aquinas on this speaks about the relations of the persons in the Trinity as not separable. Uh, you can't take the Father and the Son or the Holy Spirit away from each other. They are what he calls pure relations. They're not uh, they're not parts that are combined together. Like I could take, you know, three parts of a pie and separate them and put them back together and have the whole pie. That's not what the persons of the Trinity are. Uh, they are pure relations, not with, with no uh, distinguishing substance. You don't have three beings of God that are somehow loosely configured together. Uh, what you have are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are distinctions of relationship we can make in God. But if you if you somehow think of them separate from each other, they disappear uh, because they don't have any meaning uh, without their union with the other. So there is a supreme oneness between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, but at the same time, a distinction we can make between the relation that exists there. Uh, the, the analogy that Aquinas uses for this, I'm sure we talked about it at some point, but the analogy he likes to use, his favorite analogy for the Trinity, is the relations within the human uh, intellect itself, uh, that the intellect uh, is related to its own thought and its own will, uh, but we can't think about those as separable from each other. Uh, we can only think of them as in relationship to each other. And in, in God, intellect, thought, and will uh, are infinite and perfect, and therefore they are supremely personal uh, in the way that we understand it in the, in the mystery of the Trinity. Uh, but in any case, uh, he doesn't raise the issue of the Trinity in this context uh, because he's talking about uh, uh, simplicity in respect to uh, God not being composed of principles that can be separated or that in any way make God a composite of things uh, that are reducible to something more basic than his own uh, oneness, his own being. 
Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, excellent distinctions. And man, and you also handled the Trinity very well too. That's that's uh, yeah, for those who are listening, you, you got to go and listen to his program again and memorize that description of the Trinity. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, well, you know the 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 history of theology has been in some ways a struggle to find an adequate way of thinking about what we mean by the Trinity. And there have been many efforts to try to do that, uh, most of which have been uh, not very helpful, uh, Some, a small handful of which uh, have been uh, somewhat helpful. I think there's maybe three or four analogies that I think are worth uh, using for the Trinity. One is, I think the very best one is the one that Aquinas prefers. It's not unique to him. Uh, you can find it in uh, in St. Augustine's book on the Trinity, but I think Aquinas develops it in a, in a very powerful way. I can still remember, I, I, I know I mentioned this, I think, in the book and, and in our conversations, but I can still remember the first time I took seriously Aquinas' uh, writings on the Trinity, I still remember where I was. Uh, I was sitting in in uh, the living room of my house with a coffee table in front of me, and I was sitting on the floor, and I had books out in front of me, and I just started reading Aquinas on the Trinity, on the persons of the Trinity in the Summa of Theology, and I was just blown away by the uh, by the beauty and elegance of of this analogy of the human intellect uh, for the persons of the Trinity. Uh, but there's a couple of others that ha- that have some value. Uh, there's the uh, uh, there's the analogy of the church. You know, Jesus uses this one in his prayers in John uh, 17. He says, Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one, as I am in you and you are in me. Uh, may they also be one in us. And so interpersonal relationship and the oneness of the people of God, ideally when we're in, in union with each other and working toward a common end, uh, functions as something of an analogy of the relationships between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, not a perfect analogy, but it is an analogy nonetheless uh, that can be helpful. Another one is, of course, the analogy of the family, you know, that um, a man will leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they'll become one flesh. What God has joined together, do not let man tear asunder. And so the relationships of the of the, the husband-wife and the eventual children that come from their union uh, provides a kind of triadic relationship uh, that uh, can function as something of of an analogy for the Trinity. But that being said, it's still not as, uh, the the danger of those analogies is that they can uh, make us think of God as three beings or three bodies walking around, uh, when in fact, uh, that's uh, not what we're trying to communicate. So what the analogy of the mind effectively does is it helps us to remember that we can't take the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit apart from each other, uh, that they are inseparably one. Uh, uh, so so anyway, uh, the, I think maybe multiple analogies like that can help us limp toward a sense of what we mean uh, by the mystery of the Trinity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also the church usually ga- gravitates towards, you know, the generator and the generated. I think that's a, if you focus on that, you can't have a generator without something being generated. It, it Like you said, the terms have no meaning. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, 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 and also when we think about this in the unchanging eternity of God, it becomes what we talk about as eternally begotten of the father. Uh, so it's not that it's not that the son is begotten a long time ago from the father. It's that the the son is begotten of the father in the eternal now that is God's perfection. And so the father uh, in his eternity is giving his full nature. That's what the father is. The father is love. And so the father gives all that he is. And the son is that eternal gift of the father. And the Holy Spirit is that love binding them together. And so the the the. You know, the creed is trying to capture that, you know, the, uh, you know, I've been thinking some about, um, about the creed. I I mentioned the presentation I gave the other day and the conversation I had about the creed, but uh, a lot of that conversation focused on uh, Arius and Arianism at the, at the Council of Nicaea. You know, there, there was a very strong tendency in those early centuries of the church for many different reasons, philosophical and theological reasons. A lot of people leaned in the direction of thinking about the Father as very remote from us, that we can't really reach the Father. And so the Son is a secondary God that human beings are able to relate to. And this, in its extreme form, was Arianism, 
uh, where the sun was a created God that served as an intermediary between human beings and the God that we can't really reach, uh, the God that's beyond our capacity. And, uh, and so the, the, uh, the Nicene fathers uh, argued that, um, that this is not the full truth. This is, this is a, a failure to grasp how radical the Christian claim is that yes, God is remote, God is transcendent above us. And that's precisely what makes the Christian message so powerful is that that God who is so far beyond us is yet closer than we can possibly imagine to us and has shown that through the incarnation. Uh, so it's precisely God's unique supreme transcendence that also uh, serves as the uh, incredible truth or leads us to the incredible truth that God's awesome greatness that's beyond my comprehension also includes God's radical closeness to all of us human beings. Uh, and that's evidenced in the incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. It always struck me as odd that uh, for some reason we, we can grasp kind of the transcendence of God, although that's difficulty difficult, but the imminence is I think even more foreign because we don't think that, you know, we don't think of things as God is holding in existence every particle and subparticle of everything that is, you know, at this moment and continuing on. So he's incredibly imminent because he works everywhere. So he is everywhere. I think you're absolutely right. I think we have lost, I say we as a culture, I think we've lost um, many of the categories that that our ancient forefathers and foremothers had at their disposal. We we're, we grow up in such a scientifically, materialistically oriented culture, but the many ways that God is evident to us, even in just the sense of our own dependent being uh, and our own inner life and the work of God in the soul of human beings, uh, we, we, we have lost, I think, in many ways, the categories for thinking about those things. So I like to think of it as we've, we've, uh, we've lost the ability to hear and listen to the language of God. Uh, we need to relearn the language of God. Uh, and uh, that leads me to things like what you just described as a sense of our radical dependence on God, uh, something we've lost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, brilliant presentation, lots of food for thought. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Gary.